Guess who's back in town? <laughs> How awesome was Connie and Max One Church? Did any of you go? Any, any were part of that? Yeah. So cool to have people from different walks of, of life, different backgrounds, different cultures coming to the same stadium at the same time as one body, one voice, as one church to make a statement in our community that we are better together. And I am pleased to announce that we have already been invited back by Connie Mack for 2020, and we already have more churches sign up next year than we did this year. So I'm really, really thankful and grateful for that. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a blast. <laughs> Worshiping God as, as one body and one voice. I do want to give a shout out to the people from this particular congregation. We had 14 churches that showed up uh, last week to, to Ricketts Park. Uh, and there's a lot of people that serve from different congregations. But from this particular congregation, in this particular group of people, there was people that made Connie Max One Church service possible. So if you were part of the parking team, the welcoming team, the food team, the security team, the medical team, the usher team, the greeter team, the prayer team, the worship team, the media team, or any other team, <laughs> thank you. Because there's no possible way. Thank, yeah. <laughs> So if you didn't come this year because you're like, oh, I don't want to deal with the parking or with the heat or I'd just rather be at the lake for one more weekend, don't make that mistake next year because it's going to be bigger and better and even more significant, more of an impact, more of a statement to our community next year than what we already made this year. So it was a blast and I'm thankful. But now that Connie Mac is over, it finished up, they wrapped up their last games last night and Connie Mac is done and therefore summer pretty much is done, right? <laughs> now that Connie Mac is over, summer is, is on, on the end as well, at the end, uh, tail end. So in the next couple of weeks, people are going to be making new schedules, new routines. They're going back to school. It's the fall all over again. So I thought it would be appropriate to start a series called Hashtag Goals. And, and let me tell you what this series is not about. It's not about all the goals, the field goals, the touchdowns, all the points that the, the Cowboys will inevitably be scoring in the coming months. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Boo. Let me tell you also what, is, what this series is not about. It's not about the lack of goals that the Broncos will not be making in the coming months. <laughs> At least we could agree on that, right? So, so that's not what it's about. Here's what this two-week series is about. It's about one particular phrase, which is this, to focus where we should focus. That's what this whole series is about, to focus where we should focus. Because as the new semester, as the fall comes, we're going to have opportunities to say yes over here, over here, over here. What do we say yes to? What do we say no to? Do we go this direction, that direction? Do we go that direction, that direction? Which direction should we go? What should we invest our time in? Perhaps you've heard this quote before by author Lewis Carroll. Lewis said this. He said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. If you don't know where you're going, any path is going to get you there. So we could just float through life and, and just maybe arrive at someplace good, or we can be intentional by creating goals. We can, we can be intentional by figuring out this is the direction or that's the direction that we should be going. Several decades ago, uh, somebody came up with this acronym for goals called SMART goals. Perhaps you've heard of this before. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of SMART goals before. Okay, 30 of you, good. Uh, the rest of you, dumb goals, good. Uh, so SMART goals, here's what this guy come, came up with. I don't know who, who uh, uh, is attributed of, of authoring this, but SMART goals stand for this. It stands for specific measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-sensitive. Those are SMART goals. Now, now, some people have switched some of these letters around. They take measurable off and they make it motivating, or they take time-sensitive and say, oh, let's make it trackable. So some people have modified this, but other people have completely overhauled their SMART goals and completely switched them all together. And this is what some people look at as the acronym of SMART goals. They started a specific goal. They moaned about the measurement. They asked when that goal is going to be over. They realized they never should have started the goal. And then the T in the SMART goal is think about a new goal. That's what some people look at as their goals. And, and they're like, I don't like making goals because I'm not good at achieving those goals. But just because you may have failed in making goals in the past doesn't mean that you should not make goals. We can be goal-oriented people, and they can be good for us. They can be healthy for us. So I want to give you three arguments this morning as far as why you should be somebody who considers making goals as we head into the fall. If you have a program, you can take out your notes and a pen or a pencil, and you can follow, follow along. Here's the first argument that I have for you. First reason is this. Goals build character. Goals build character. God is more interested in your character than your accomplishments. Let me say that again for the workaholics. Say that again for, for the people who, who have taken their career and made that their entire identity. God is more concerned about your character than your accomplishments. Which is why I'm a huge advocate for, for younger people being involved in sports and athletics and extracurricular activities when they're young. For, for students in middle school or high school or even in college, it's good. Because the, the statistics is that 99% of people who are student athletes never move on to become pro. 
99% of them. Even some of these athletes that were here for Connie Mack and they were in host homes, most of those baseball players will never become pro. So is it a waste of time that they play baseball or the softball or soccer or football? Is it a waste of time that you're investing time? It's not a waste of time when, when kids are investing time in a sport because they're not only building camaraderie and teamwork, but they're also building and developing character. Character is a positive thing. God wants us to establish and build character in our lives. Romans 5, 2 through 4 says this. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Character is a big deal to God. God wants us to have character. Now, now I will say this regarding sports and athletics. Sometimes, sometimes for families, they elevate a sport like baseball or football so much that it trumps God. That sport becomes God to that family or to that student athlete. And when, when a sport becomes a, a wedge in somebody's relationship with God, then it's, it, it's a toxic thing. It's not a good thing when it becomes the God in your life. But, but if it's something that is building character, that can be a, a great thing. Do you know one of the greatest demographics of people who build character in other people? Teachers. Principals. Coaches. Counselors at schools. Mentors. In fact, many of those educators, you're going, going back to school if you haven't already gone back to school because most of the educators go back before the students do and students are going back in the next week or two. So if you happen to be on staff at any public or private school anywhere in this region, will you please stand so we can recognize you? Any educators, principals, teachers, <laughs> coaches, janitors, lunch ladies, stay standing for a second. Stay standing for just a second. Stay standing for just a second. You're on the front lines. What you're doing has significant eternal value. And sometimes perhaps there's going to be days that you're like, man, I want to throw in the towel. Am I making a difference? Am I making any sort of difference at all in, in, the, in the young people that you're investing in? And the answer is yes. Consider this quote. Stay standing for a second. Consider this quote from Bill Gates. He said this, if you want your child to get the best education possible, it is actually more important to get him assigned to a great teacher than to a great school. We have a great school here, Pinion Hills Academy. We have a great staff, great principal, great teachers. But I also know that there's many God-fearing people, whether you work at Pinion Hills Academy or some other school, some other district, great God-fearing people who are on the front lines, and you have a responsibility. You have a role in impacting people and their lives and families and their legacies to come. So as you're standing, we just want to take a moment to pray for you because you're about to head back to school and you're about to be, uh, be making a difference in people's lives. And I want to commission you forward as you head back that God would use you in significant ways, no matter what school, what district you're a part of. I want to blanket you with prayer. So let's pray together for the people that are standing right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for them. Thank you for the fact that they are investing their career, their time, their lives, their efforts, their passions into the next generation. God, may you bless these educators May you go before them. Give them opportunities to, to invest. It's, it's each person that's standing right now that has the potential, no matter what school they're a part of, to invest and make, the, and make a difference in people's lives. So God, give them the opportunity to see the students who are hurting. Give them the opportunity to come along, alongside students and make a difference in their lives, to help build character in their lives, to help build morals, to build standards. God, thank you for them. Thank you for the work that they do. Thank you for the passions that you've entrusted to them. I pray that they're able to take those things and make our community a better place. It, we, we've heard it said that it takes a village to raise a child. It takes many of these frontline workers to be a part of that village. God, we thank you for them, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give them one more round of applause as you take your seats. <laughs> School is heading back, and as teachers and educators and coaches are going back, you have an opportunity to create Goals that help create character in our young people. God wants us to be people of character. That's one reason why we should make goals. Goals help build character. There's another reason why you should have goals as well. Goals build rewards. And what I mean by that is that I've never met somebody that's made a toxic goal before. I've never, I've never met somebody that wants an unhealthy goal. Ne nobody's ever come up to me and said, Matt, here's my goal. For the next 90 days, I want to put on 50 pounds. <laughs> I've never heard somebody say that. Maybe aside from an actor that's like trying to play a role or something, but people don't make goals that are unhealthy for themselves. Sometimes they make decisions that lead to unhealthy things, but they don't make that a goal. I've never heard somebody say, you know what, in the next 30 days, I want to sabotage my career and get fired. I've never heard that. 
I've never heard somebody say, hey, in the, in, in the next couple of months, by, by fall or by, by the holidays, I want to sabotage my marriage, and I want to lose uh, my marriage and my reputation for my kids. I've never heard people make goals like that. Again, people make decisions that are poor decisions, but if we make good goals, it helps per perhaps prevent some of the bad decisions that we're going to make. Now, now speaking of marriage, as we head into the fall, this is a great thing that could be one of your goals is that you, uh, that you work in your marriage. It's, it's never a bad time to work on your marriage, whether you're struggling in your marriage or whether, it's a, whether you're, you're doing well in your marriage. I would encourage you to really focus on your marriage and be intentional with it. In fact, in a couple of weeks, three weeks from now, we have what's called a living room reset. Uh, and it's led by a guy named Kirk Cameron. Ever, anybody remember Kirk Cameron from Growing Pains? Yeah, yeah, one huge fan of Growing Pains, yay. Uh, anyway, so Kirk Cameron is, is coming here to, to Farmington. In fact, he's coming to this particular church. You could go and be a part of this uh, marriage conference any, anywhere in the nation. They have them in California, Colorado, Arizona, Texas. But in the state of New Mexico, there's one place that you can go and be a part of this marriage conference called the Living Room Reset, and that's right here at Pinion Hills Community Church. We're the only venue in the entire state of New Mexico. And they kind of give you an idea of what this marriage conference looks like. It's one night. It's, uh, it's on uh, Saturday, August 24th. It's one night for just a couple hours long, starting at 6 p.m. But to give you a taste in the teaser as far as what this looks like, check out this video with Kirk Cameron. So there I was, sitting in my living room at home, and Chelsea comes in and says to me that there's something wrong with the bathroom sink. So I hop up, I go to see what's going on with it, I open up the cabinet doors, and I see a positive pregnancy test. Best broken sink ever! If you're like us, the living room is the hub of the home. It's, it's where all the important stuff happens, from the joy of new life being announced to the news of tragedy being shared. And it's the place where a thousand family memories are made. I've found that through the last 22 years of being a dad, 27 years of being a husband, that there is nothing our families can't get through, nothing we can't figure out if we'll just gather in the living room and take time to reset a few things, refocus on the things that really matter. Starting in January of 2018, we are packing a trailer and taking the living room across the entire nation for a 30-stop marriage and parenting tour that I'm simply calling Living Room Reset. For the first time ever, my wife Chelsea is going to be a part of this tour. And I'm really excited about the cool stuff we have planned. Things that I don't think anyone's ever done before, like allowing you to help choose the content every night. So every event will be custom tailored. Whether you want to talk about cherishing your spouse for a lifetime, to the, the why and the how of forgiveness, to parenting skills, like securing the heart of your child, avoiding negative conflict. What about discipline? And then in the teenage years, help and hope for raising kids in a social media world and the right practices and boundaries for dating. This is going to make no two events the same. And joining us are some amazing Christian music artists, some other guests, and even some throwback growing pain surprises as well. So go to KirkCameron.com, check out the dates, and reserve your seat. Let's learn how to give our families a living room reset. That is coming up here at Pinion Hills Community Church three weeks from now, Saturday, August 24th. Tickets start at $25, and there's more information for registration out in the plaza when you leave today. I would encourage you to perhaps make that one of your goals this fall, to work and invest in your marriage, most important relationship that you have, your marriage. Here's what Solomon says in Proverbs 11:27. He says, "Whoever seeks good finds favor, but evil comes to one to the one who searches for it." Whoever seeks good finds favor. Here's here's what Solomon's saying. If you look for good, you find good. If you look for bad, you find bad. So well, what we should be doing is, is making goals that lead to good rewards for us. Goals build character. Goals build rewards. There's a third thing that goals build, goals build, which is this, the kingdom of God. Goals build. They have the potential of building the kingdom of God. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 5.10. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are persecuted because of righteousness, because we're making good goals, perhaps it's difficult, 
but heaven, eternity is impacted when we're making goals. Now, now, so far I've just talked about three reasons. Three reasons why you should uh, perhaps consider making goals. Those three reasons. Goals build character. Goals build rewards. Goals build the kingdom. But some of you probably are already on board with making goals. Maybe I don't need to twist your arm. Maybe I don't need to convince you why we need to build goals into our lives. Maybe you already do. Maybe the question isn't how should we build goals. Maybe the question really should be how should we build godly goals. Not just to make any random goal out there, but how can we make a goal that is honoring to God, that when we achieve that goal, that God looks to us and says, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. You did a good job. That was a good, godly goal. How do we create godly goals? Well, if we're going to make godly goals, who else to, to who better else to, to follow and, and emulate than Jesus himself? Jesus had priorities. He had goals. He had things that he focused on. So, so if we were to look at what Jesus did and how he lived his life, maybe that would give us a better idea as far as how we should live our lives. Here's what Paul said to the Philippians about following after Jesus. Philippians 3.10. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of, the, of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not, not that I have already obtained all this or that I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold for me or of me. And here's, here's what Paul's saying. He's basically saying, hey, whatever Jesus' goal was should be my goal. Whatever he focused on should be what I focused on. Whatever he was about, I want to be about. So if we take that cue as well, if we're saying, okay, as a follower of Jesus, I want, to, I want to follow after his footsteps. I want to follow with what was important to him. Then maybe we should look at Jesus. What was his goal? Well, Jesus clarifies that. He says in Mark 10, 45, here's Jesus' goal, speaking about himself. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That was his entire goal in life, to give up his life to love other people. That was his goal. That was his ultimate end game goal. Now, what the Bible doesn't really specifically say is all the hundreds, if not thousands, of little mini micro goals that led up to that goal. What we do have is the Gospels, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. talks about a lot of the stories, a lot of the miracles, a lot of the things that Jesus did. But it doesn't talk about every single decision that Jesus made along the way leading up to his end game goal. But what the Bible does talk about are some themes, some things that, that Jesus would continually do on a recurring basis, not necessarily a goal, but I would call these habits. These were habits that Jesus made to keep him in a line with his end game goal. So, so what I'd like to do in the next couple of weeks, today and next week, is unpack six main habits that Jesus had. And, and look at his habits. What did he prioritize? What did he focus on? And perhaps these are habits that we can, too, adopt ourselves that will help us figure out what to say yes to, what to say no to, and help create alignment as far as what our lives should be like. If we're following after Jesus and his footsteps, then perhaps we can take his habits as well. So here's one of the habits that Jesus emulated or, or exemplified. Habit number one is this, prioritizing prayer. Jesus did this on a recurring daily basis. He would pray and pray and pray all the time. He would pray for big things. He would pray for little things. He would pray for events that had already happened, events that were about to happen. He would pray for all sorts of different things. On 45 different occasions throughout the Gospels, we were told that Jesus went alone and prayed. He got by himself and prayed. Now, here's what we know about Jesus. Jesus was a busy dude. <laughs> He went from town to town, village to village. He, he was healing people. He was performing miracles. He would do impossible things. But people gathered around him and flocked. And in fact, at one point, he gets into a boat to sail across the, the lake to the other side. And there's a crowd of people that follow alongside the lake to get to him on the other side. He was busy. He was a popular guy. People wanted to talk with him and hang out with him all the time. But even though he was busy, even though he was loving people 24-7, he was helping people and ministering people to people 24-7, here's what we also see with Jesus. He would intentionally make time to get alone and pray. Even if it meant he stayed up later than usual or he got up earlier in the morning than usual, he would always find time to pray. Here's my question for you. Do you always find time to pray? Do you always find time to pray not just for the big things in life, but also the small decisions in life. As you're heading into the fall and you have all sorts of different things as far as life's going to get busy, do you have any sort of filter to figure out where you should invest your time? Do you pray about the different things that you're involved in? Do you pray about what you should say yes to, what you should say no to? Jesus blanketed everything he did with prayer. Everything was saturated in prayer. Here's what the Bible says about prayer, Ephesians 6.18. It says, pray in the spirit 
on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Not just sometimes or some occasions, on all occasions we are called and challenged to pray. Which is why in James 5.13 it says this, Is any one of you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anybody happy? Let them sing songs of praise, not just in bad times, but also in good times. We should pray. Everything that we do, we should go to God with prayer. First Chronicles 16.11 says this, Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. How do we seek the face of God? We pray. When should we do that? Always. We should continually go back to God. We should continually make that a habit in our lives to pray. Now, I know that there's many people in here that perhaps don't pray. It's not a habit in your life. But maybe, you, maybe it could be a habit in your life. Maybe you're like, okay, if I'm going to make a habit that Jesus had, Jesus prioritized prayer. He would find time throughout the day, throughout the night, throughout the morning to pray. If you're going to become more Christ-like this fall, if you were to implement prayer, prioritize prayer, but it's not already a habit, perhaps you can make it a habit. Here's a couple things that you can do to, to practically make it a habit. Here's some, some tips for you. One, you can set an alarm. Set an alarm on your phone. So it beeps, bing. Time to pray. It might sound a little bit trivial, a little bit childish, but you're building in a new habit. In fact, research used to be that if you did something for 21 days in a row, you've established a new habit. Or if you refrain from doing something for 21 days in a row, you've established a new habit. But newer research within the last two years says that it's actually a little bit longer than 21 days. It's around 30 to 66 days. If you can do something every day for 30 to 66 days, you've established a new habit. So maybe for the next 30 days, you set an alarm on your phone. So it beeps, and it, it reminds you to pray. Or schedule it into your calendar. So it shows up on your calendar like an event or like a date or like something else that you would put in there. You're making a date with yourself and God. Perhaps that's an idea. There's another thing. Download Habit Bowl. Now, Habit Bowl is an app for the smartphones. Let me, let me show you a picture of what, as far as what Habit Bowl looks like on the screen. Uh, Habit Bowl... It shows you the days that you've succeeded in doing something. If you set a goal for yourself, you set a habit for yourself, you can say, okay, on, on the first, you did it, you, you, you accomplished it here and here and here, and it'll show you any days that you missed, like on the 17th, you missed that day, but it'll kind of give you a visual reminder as far as how you've been succeeding in that goal. Now, you could do this for anything. You could do this for flossing. You could do this for taking out the trash. You could do this for spending time with your spouse. It could be any habit that you want to incorporate, but this will help you keep you on track so you can visualize how often that you're actually coming back and doing that habit. So those are just a few practical tips as far as how you can incorporate prayer into a daily part of your life. That was what Jesus did. He prioritized prayer. So perhaps we can take that habit ourselves and adopt it as well. Here's another habit that Jesus incorporated into his life. He embraced outcasts. He loved people who other people didn't want to love. And he did this not just a couple times. He did this on a recurring daily basis. People that were ignored, people that were neglected, people that others struggled loving. He intentionally sought them out. Perhaps because Jesus knew that love changes lives for the better. That we are designed and created to crave and desire love from God and from other people. So Jesus said, okay, if other, if other people aren't loving these people, I'll do it. I'll go and love them. He embraced the outcasts. Here's what Jesus says in Mark 2, 17. He said, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the, not, not call the, <laughs> let me say that again. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He's clarifying what his role is. And he intentionally sought out other people that, that many people in society would ignore or cast aside. Students, if you're in middle school or high school, as you head back to school in the next couple of weeks, this is one of the biggest challenges to help you become a difference maker on your campus. If you seek out the people who are the outcasts, the people that don't have friends, if there's somebody sitting alone by themselves and they don't have anybody to eat with at lunch, if you were to simply go and sit with them and have lunch with them and have a conversation, you have no idea how that could impact their day. You might make their day. You might make their week, their month, their semester, maybe their year. You could perhaps change an entire life by choosing to embrace outcasts, people that other people aren't embracing. Now, I'm not saying you have to go up and hug them and kiss them and date them or anything like that. I'm just saying be loving, be intentional about loving people who other people don't oftentimes love, not just students, but as adults as well. Are there people in our path, people that we come across that we can be intentionally loving? Because Jesus made a habit of that every day. He was looking for people that were without love, and he chose to love them. Here's a third habit that Jesus incorporated into his daily life. He restored the broken. Now, there's a difference between outcasts and the broken. Outcasts are people who are oftentimes not loved in society or in our culture, but the broken are people that have 
maybe perhaps gone through a tragedy recently. Maybe they've lost, lost a loved one. Maybe they've lost a job. Maybe they're going through a difficult time with their health. I don't, whatever it may be, they're broken. They're brokenhearted. And Jesus oftentimes would look for those people as well to come alongside them in their hurt and provide comfort. He would look for those people. Now, Jesus had some sort of abilities as, as God in the flesh. He could heal people. He could restore people. He could heal the blind and heal the lame and heal the sick. He had abilities that we, without God's power, don't have. Jesus could do things that you and I can't necessarily do. But the, the intentionality was still there. We can still have the intentionality, just like Jesus did, to go and intentionally come alongside people who are broken, to provide the hug, to send a text message, to write a letter, to bring a meal. There's many different things that we can do to come alongside people who are hurting and broken. Now, these are just three habits that Jesus made. Next week, we're going to talk about another three habits that he made and incorporated. But these three habits, these three habits, let me review them. Prioritize prayer. Habit number two, embracing outcasts. Number three, restoring the broken. Now, if we're going to be people who follow after Jesus, perhaps we should take his habits and make them our habits. Here's what Peter said about following after Jesus' example, 1 Peter 2.21. He said, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. We are called to follow in the steps of Christ. We're called to follow his example, follow his lead. And if he prioritized things, maybe we should prioritize things. Rather than just floating through life and whatever happens, happens. And, and maybe I'll do something if it happens to come along. If we are creating habits in our lives and, and prioritizing prayer and looking for outcasts to love them, looking for ways to restore the broken, if we're implementing these habits, then maybe it keeps us more in line of being like Jesus. Maybe that's part of what we should be doing in, in the upcoming fall, in the upcoming weeks and months to come. Now we have a decision. You and I have a decision. As we head into fall, you can just go about things, business as usual. Life will just happen to me as I go through life, and I'm not going to have any sort of specific direction, and all real roads lead to the same place because you don't really have any sort of goals. You don't really have an idea, are you succeeding or not? So you just float through life, and you go wherever the wind takes you. You can go through life like that. Or you can be intentional and say, okay, you know what? I want my life to matter. I want my life to impact people. I want to have a purpose. And if, if you want your life to really matter, I would encourage you, create godly goals. And to create godly goals, I can't tell you specifically what those goals are for, for each one of you. But what I can tell you is if we adopt these habits that Jesus adopted, if we make those habits our, ourselves, it will help us discern and help us decide what we should say yes to, what we should say no to, whether we should go this direction or this direction, this direction or this direction. If we have these habits built into our lives, it'll help create clarity as far as where, as far as where we should go and where we should not go. Now, let me give you a practical example for how you can incorporate all three of the habits we talked about this morning at the same time. In two weeks from today, on August 18th, we're having what we call the fall kickoff here at Pinion Hills Community Church. And the fall kickoff is just basically a time where everybody's starting new routines and they're starting new schedules and they're getting back into the groove of things. And, and while oftentimes church is kind of on the back burner, like I'll go to church if I have time, we want to in, in, encourage people and challenge people, make God a part of your recurring daily life. Don't put God on the back burner, put him on the front burner. Have him be a part of, of everything that you do. So as you're layering things in and adding things to your schedule, church and God and worship are a part of your routine, not on the back burner, but something that you do on a recurring, regular basis. So on, on uh, the 18th of August and two Sundays from today, we're having our fall kickoff. And just to make it exciting and create kind of a buzz, we're, we're putting a donut wall out in the plaza. So when you show up, there's going to be like hundreds and thousands of donuts out there. So it's going to be a, a really fun time unless you're like diabetic. And then, sorry. Uh, but, but it's going to be a really fun time and it's going to be a, a, a lot of fun even in the children's ministry area. Uh, we are going to have fun and games and all sorts of stuff teaching about Jesus over there as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun over there. That same evening in our student ministry, we're having a fall kickoff for all of our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. The whole day is going to be filled with a lot of buzz and excitement for get plugged back into church. That's two Sundays from today. But perhaps leading up to that in two weeks from now, from today and the, uh, for the next two weeks, maybe you can incorporate the three habits we just talked about. Maybe, maybe you could prioritize prayer for the next two weeks and say, okay, God, I want to pray consistently every single day, but specifically, I want to pray, God, that you bring me the outcasts, people that aren't being loved. Because what if you were to show love to somebody that doesn't oftentimes receive love? What if you were just to simply invite them to come to church on the 18th for our fall kickoff? 
And because there's excitement, because there's buzz in the air for that, maybe they show up with you, but maybe it's not a one-time thing. Maybe they build that into their schedule. And maybe because you invited them, maybe, maybe because they show up to a fall kickoff where there's donuts on a wall hanging out in the plaza, maybe they continue coming and maybe their entire life changes. I know that my life has significantly changed because of God in it. My life looks completely different because I've surrendered my life to God. And for many of you, you would say the same thing. Why not pray for people that you could extend an invitation to that they perhaps hear the message of the gospel? They hear about hope and joy and love and grace and forgiveness. In fact, this series that we're starting two weeks from today is called Reset. Many people just need to hit the reset button on their faith and their lives, and perhaps God can be a part of that reset. So you can incorporate these habits we've talked about today. You can be prioritizing prayer, praying for outcasts, praying for people that, that are broken and down, and down and out. Maybe you can invite them. And when I say invite them, here's my challenge to you. If you extend an invitation for somebody to come to church, don't just say, hey, you should come to my church. You should come to Pinion Hills on, on August 18th. Don't just say that. You should say this. Will you come with me? Will you sit with me? Will you be my guest? And have them sit right next to you. Don't just have them blend in and mix into somewhere. Have them be your guest. You be intentional with them. This is just a simple, practical way that we can implement all three of these habits that we talked about. Prioritizing prayer, praying that God brings you outcast, brings you the broken, that he, he gives you the perspective, that you choose to have the perspective that God has for people, that you look at people through the same lens that God looks at them, that every person matters, every life matters. And think that God uses broken, jacked up people like you and I to make a difference in eternity in people's lives? What a blessing. So with that, I know that many of you are thinking of a person right now. You're thinking, well, shoot, I could extend the invitation to this person. They haven't been to church in a long time. Or this coworker or this family member. I could send a text message. I could, I could call them after the service. I know I'm going to bump into them in the office tomorrow. I know many of you are thinking of somebody. And, and perhaps you don't have somebody on your mind right now. But if you do, I want to just take a moment to pray for that person. To pray that perhaps they would be open-minded to saying yes and accepting your invitation to come two Sundays from now for our fall kickoff. Because maybe that, maybe that changes their life. Maybe it changes their fall so let's pray for those people, and if you don't have somebody in your mind, that's okay too, because I'm going to pray that God brings you somebody that can put on your mind and in your path that you could be somebody that invites them, extends the invitation to perhaps change their direction. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up these people to you. We lift up the family members, the co-workers, the friends. We know that, God, you change people's lives. When we submit to your will, when we choose to follow after you, God, things change for the better. So God, I pray for the fall kickoff in two weeks that, that people who haven't come for a long time come back. I pray for each one of my friends that are here today that, that they would choose to, to have a perspective that you have, that they would look for people who are down and out, look for the brokenhearted, look for the outcasts, and not just see them and turn their head and, and look the other direction, but, but choose to engage them, choose to, to be loving to them. I pray that we can be people who don't just go through life and float through life, but that we intentionally saturate everything that we do with prayer, that we go to you with everything with prayer, that it would keep us in line with your will. God, we thank you for the fact that you love us, that you choose to pursue us, that you, you give us your word, that we can apply it to our lives and that our lives will be better off because of it. We thank you for that. I thank you for all the people that are here today. Give us opportunities to make a difference in the lives of other people. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen.